but no one was there to save this tiger. And he said to the deer, now you will not, I will not leave you. You are running away from me. And he said, I'm sorry, but I'm, keep, I'm keeping safe the king's belt. And the belt was a sleeping python rolled on a tree. So the lion said, what a belt? I want to wear it. So the deer said, oh, tiger, you can't wear it. You know, it's the king's belt. And the king will die. King will kill me if you use that belt. So the tiger said, I'll not listen to you. So he ran to the tree where the python was sleeping and tried to tie the python onto his waist. And the sleepy, angry python was awakened and he just rolled his whole body in the tiger's body and the tiger could not breathe. So he died at that moment. So you can see the smartness of that young deer. So like this, he said, no fear of any animal in the jungle. The end. Thank you. Yeah, every time you come, all that chocolate I sent you must have done something. Okay, because you're just better every time you come here. That is wonderful. Thank you very much for being here. And I'll say, are you be as here as long as I like. Are you at school tomorrow or are you on school holidays? No, they aren't. No school? On 18th, they'll start. Okay. <laughs> right, so we're going to Shabidia now. Who come from, which part of India are you from? Are you from the Punjab as well? Yes, it's um, northwestern part. Yeah. It's Shibidia, can we hear you? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Jason. Your, your story was very cute. Uh, I am from Chennai, Mike. I'm from uh, Chennai, India, which is the southern uh, most uh, eastern right. southern part of India. Yeah, and you, uh, you have a really good cricket team. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all know about the Chennai Super Kings over here. Yes. We follow yes. the cricket. Okay. <laughs> well, over to you, Shibidia. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, so today I bring you a story from India. Again, a story that I have heard it from my mother. It's called The King with Donkey Ears. It's a very nice story. I enjoy it. So I hope you will also do that. Okay. Okay, long, long time ago, there was a kingdom. And in that kingdom, there was a king. The king who would always decorate his head with a very fine silk turban. And he would wear the rich, the costly clothes, the pearls, the diamonds, and he would always wear a beautiful smile and a spark in his eyes. He was such a kind and a well-administered king that everybody in the kingdom just loved him. They adored him. They said, oh, how handsome this king looks like. Wow, how tall he is. Oh, look at his moustache. Wow. And just look the way he rides on his horse. Man, all was so fine. The king was seemingly a very, very happy man. There was a secret. But the king was you know, always filled with his ministers and this and that. But he had his separate, you know, his separate room where no one was allowed. No one. Not even his servants. But there was only one person just with the permission of the king was allowed was a hairdresser. A normal hairdresser, but he was quite old. He seemed to be the most loyal man in the entire kingdom. So the king's chamber which was like totally, you know, uh, away from the rest of the world. It was inside seven doors and there the king's chamber will come. And there was no security. There was, there was nothing but only the king and to be allowed the hairdresser. That too, only once in a month. So this hairdresser would always take up his, you know, kit. The security would check him. 
before he enters the first door and then he would go and on and on and on to the seventh door where the king would be sitting and then he closes the door and then around one hour or so he would come out he go off but he would just cover his mouth with a kerchief or with a cloth and he will move out now nobody were allowed to ask a single question about who what why nothing it was absolutely a monopoly it was absolutely an auto autocratic you know kingdom that no one had any rights to talk about anything against the king not even a single doubt to be brought into their minds so the days passed on and on and on and on things were running on and on and on and on and one fine day like how we have now this covid 19 virus threatening us the hairdresser who was already quite old <laughs> he also fell ill <laughs> his cough his heart pain his head pain all that weakened his body that he was no longer able to walk no if he was not able to walk he was not able to get up from his bed the king can get a hairdresser every month now the ministers advise the king oh can we appoint another you know hairdresser for you we got the best and best of hairdressers in the world that are ready, waiting to come and adorn you the king but the king said oh, oh, oh no 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 way i want only that hairdresser but the hairdresser was not able to come so the king himself wrote a letter he sent a message himself he sent a message to the ill hairdresser it stated if you cannot come you send one very very loyal person like only like you and the hairdresser who could just read it he could think none other than his young son the son was given the tool the box and then the son got ready because it was a special assignment into the king's chamber and then he went in the security guards checked him and then he went in the doors opened and onto the seventh door the golden door opened and there he went in and all the other six doors closed and so was the seventh door closed and there was complete silence in the room there was velvet curtains all around the windows were closed and there was a round circular bed around it there was in the corner there was a big mirror and a stool there our hairdresser young hairdresser walked in and there came the king and he sat down on the stool and the hairdresser started to remove the turban the cloth turban top 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 and as he removed he saw something was kind of you know kind of disturbing the turban he kept on removing it and as he finally removed it something popped out something popped out from the king and the young hairdresser looked at <laughs> laughed inside himself not outside all inside there was nothing coming out he was inside laughing seeing the king actually had a donkey ear this bug donkey ear and as it popped out the king looked at him and he said secret this is the secret of the king dare not tell anyone about it the young hairdresser obliged and he immediately did the, all the hair cutting he did all that work and then he packed the stool and then he prayed and then he started back and then as he came out <laughs> inside his heart was laughing and he was just about to see the security guards he was about to tell you know what <laughs> oh no and then he kept on walking and then he saw his wife he said you know what 
No, he was not supposed to tell the secret. This is the king's secret. <laughs> his heart laughed again. He went to his father and he looked at the father and the father said, do not tell the secret out. So the young hairdresser was full of, full of laughter and full of story to tell everyone that our king has got talking ears and he kept running, but he could not share. So he went outside, outside the kingdom. Then he found a tree and then he found a land and he cried. <sighs> he dug a hole and then he looked, got inside and said, <laughs> our king has still got a donkey ear. Our king has got a donkey ear. And he kept telling it. He flashed out all the secret into the sand and then he closed it. Days passed, years passed, and in the same same place, there grew a tree, a huge tree. Once there was a wedding to happen to the king, and there was this announcement to be made, and then there was a drummer who went on searching for the best tree to cut, and then he saw a super tree, and then he cut it down. He made a drumstick, and he got into the whole kingdom, and he started to drum with that stick. Then stick the tree where the secret was hidden. And as he started, dong, 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 the king has got a donkey ear. Dong, 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 the king has got a donkey, donkey ear. Ding, dong, 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 the king has got a donkey ear. <gasps> All the kingdom, everyone got them to know. What? 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 Everybody came to know that the king has a donkey ear. Oh, 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 oh. And then the secret was out forever. The king has no other choice but to remove the donkey, remove the turban and came in front of the kingdom and said, this is my great donkey here. This is my great donkey here. I am blessed with the donkey here. And then days continue. Thank you so much for listening to my story. The king who had donkey ears. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shibnidia. That's a lovely story, well told. And thank you for telling it to us. And I hope to see you back here again. It's the every, at my time here is every other Sunday, so I'll be here in two weeks' time. So I'm very much pleased that you're here. And if it gets really late in your hand, just go to bed and wake up in the morning. Okay. <laughs> right, now we're going to Cathy next. Cathy Carson, who comes from Northern Ireland. Or the north part of the island of Ireland is another way of saying it, depending which way you are. Then we're going to go to me, and then we're going to go to Susan, because then we're going to tell stories about zebras, which is what we promised to do last two weeks ago. And so I've got one. And then if you've got a zebra story, now would be the time to tell me, because you can go on the end of that. But just before we go to you, Kathy, and I would just like to make a promise to two people here. There's Heather and there's Aisha. There was a storyteller in the north of Scotland called Stanley Robinson, who was a friend of mine. And I actually, as I'm sat here in this room, John, he actually slept in the room that I'm sat in because this room was in those days, back in the day, was, a, was our guest room. And he used to tell stories in those days. He told many stories and great stories, but he told some about snakes and vampires from the Highlands. Now, there's been a discussion around this, and I actually know a couple, so I'm going to tell one in a fortnight's time. I'll get it sorted out in my mind, and I'll tell it for you, because um, these, th these stories are only alive when they've been told. Dead stories are no use to anybody, and it would be a pleasure to do it, um, but I can't do it this week, so it's going to be in a fortnight's time. So, uh, Kathy, then me, then Susan, okay? Thank you, Mike. So this little poem is called Copper Pennies. <clears throat> it's about not being able to have children, but the way in which the world and the universe sometimes gifts you children anyway. So this is Copper Pennies. It was the hop, skip, drag, swagger that caught my eye. You had your fists forced into jean pockets, all grown man attitude in the small boy frame. I figured you were seven, maybe eight. I hadn't seen you before. I watched your shoulders sag further with every door closed as you went from house to house. I wondered if you were collecting or seeking sponsorship. 
and got a few coins out just in case. Watched, waited. You reached my gate. You spotted me in the window. You grinned at me like we were old friends. You strode your path with the chin in the air like you owned the world. And you knocked my door three times. And the door barely opened. You shoved a flame red head into my hallway. You scanned my living room for evidence and you asked, here, Mrs. Have you any children? And those words, they landed in the hollow of me where four children had begun. Each one conceived of hope and longing and loss and each one named. Their whole lives carved out in my heart before they left me so. No, I said, I don't have any children. And you scratched a bird's nest into your crown. And you placed your hand in mine, called cool, smooth as a pebble. And you looked up at me with copper eyes like pennies that had just dropped. And you said, Mrs. Are you not allowed them? My mommy isn't allowed me. And I remember steadying myself against the door frame, scrambling for words, anchor, breath, but you were already on my sofa, kicking off your size two trainers, tucking soft soles up in under your bottom. I'm staying with Eva, you shouted. Not the next house, not the next house, but the next house. She's my auntie. She's ginger. And you waited. And sure, I'm ginger. And you gave me this look that I would come to know men keep up. <laughs> Do you have a PlayStation? Now, at this stage, I know. I should have said you shouldn't be in a stranger's house, that maybe you should leave. But something inside me recognized this indiscriminate disclosure, this seeking out of safe adults, this need to be known and seen that if not caught, I knew it would turn into fear of the same. So instead I said, I don't have a PlayStation, but I do have Disney. Toy Story! You jumped back in my sofa, arranged the cushions because you were going nowhere. So the first time we watched Toy Story. And the second time you asked for crayons, but I had none for drawing paper and I had none. So we lay belly down on a tiled kitchen floor, drew on the back of unused wallpaper with Sharpie pens. And there were so many times after that, two years of knocks on my door with paintings for my fridge or your face lit up with pride at new trainers, but mostly you just wanted to come in because you were bored or Eva had told you to give her a headpiece. On the day we moved home to just two streets away, you wailed. You buried your flame red head into my hips and hiccuped into my pockets. Am I allowed in your new house? And I thought of all the things we both hadn't been allowed. I thought of paintings taken from my fridge, packed carefully into boxes of Toy Story and cold bellies of tile kitchen floors. Of the hollow that you had filled. I lifted your face to mine, got those pennies. Oh yes, I said, you're definitely allowed in my new house. Over the years, the visits got less until they stopped. I still see you sometimes. At 14, you tower above me now, but that hop, skip, drag swagger will catch my eye and you will grin at me like you did the first time and remind me that I may not be a mother, but I can still have children. Thanks, Mike. Oh, that was lovely. It was lovely. If you're not here in two weeks' time, I want a note from your doctor. Okay? <laughs> right. 
And I'm going to go next and talking about zebras, which is the proper way to say the name. Anybody from particularly the new world wants to say it something different. And then, Susan, we're going to go to you, right? So <clears throat> I want to go back to you. I want to go way back into the history of time. I want to go back to 1979. Now, in 1979, my daughter was born. And she's 41 years old now or so. And my father got a job in a place called Rhodesia. Now, nowadays, they call it Zimbabwe. But in those days, it was still called Rhodesia. But it was named after a fellow called Cecil Rhodes. And he got a job there as the returning officer for the United Nations. And it was his job to monitor the elections that turned Rhodesia into Zimbabwe and the free state that came from there that didn't particularly go well. But in those year, in that year, in 1979, the place was full of hope. It was full of a future. It was, it was going to be a, a utopia. It was going to be a fantastic place. And dad went there for three months. And when he was leaving, he did two things. He made a promise to me that he'd bring me back some stories from the, from the savannah, from the high veld, of stories of Cecil Rhodes and his people trekking across into new lands and, and how they were going to make the world a perfect place, or from the tribes of the Zulus and the other tribes that lived there that go back into our ancient times. And, three, and he saw my daughter. He saw our Anna once. Well, she was born two days before he left. And he popped in to say hello to his second granddaughter. And off he went. Well, he came back he, ages and a funny colour. Because we're called rust because we go rusty. Right. And he didn't go rusty. He just went brown. And I, I, he, got, he had less hair than I have. And he went bright pink and everything else, which we do from time to time. And he sat down in a pub in the middle of Worcestershire and he said, this is, I've only brought you one story, Mike. He said, and this is the one I want you to tell. I brought you some books of others, but this is the one I want you to tell. Because when we'd all finished, we had a couple of days off and we went across to a great big river with a great big dam. And on the way there, just as we turned around the corner, there was two long safari land rovers there with about 10 people in there. There was a zebra lying in the middle of the road. So the driver stopped and he said, that zebra looks a bit ill. And Dad always had a kind heart. So he got out and he walked around and he sat down. And it was obvious that the zebra was dying. But nothing, nothing in this world, no life, no one, no everywhere should die alone. So he picked up the head of this zebra and he put it on his lap as he sat down in the middle of the road. And I don't know if you knew this, and I certainly didn't know it till this moment, that every animal in Africa can speak one minute before it dies. And the zebra turned up and looked at Dad and it said, will you answer me a question? And Dad said, I'm the returning officer from Elmley Castle in Worcestershire. I probably, you can ask the question, but you're a zebra from the middle of Africa. I probably won't know the answer. Ask your question. And the zebra said, Am I a black zebra with white stripes or a white zebra with black stripes? And Dad said, well, I don't know. And the zebra died. Oh, come on, the zebra's dying. Ah, oh, poor thing's dying. Well, the zebra, it went up to the pearly gates in heaven. Now, you know about the pearly gates in heaven. There's St. Peter's stood there and they're great and they're fantastic gates and everything else. There's all sorts of story about it. But the zebra went trotting up there and sat down and Peter came out and he said, uh, can I help you? And he said, yeah, well, I want to come into heaven, please. And he goes, OK. So let's have a look. He said, yeah, so you've been a good father. You're a grandfather and a great grandfather and a great great grandfather and a great great grandfather. You're a randy lot of zebras, you lot, aren't you really? But yeah, you've got lots and lots of grandchildren and great grandchildren. Yeah, you've always donated to charity Red Nose Day. Yeah, you can always do that. You always looked after you. Said, yeah, you don't tell silly jokes like some of you do. No, okay, fair enough. We'll let you in. You've got one question. And the zebra looked at St. Peter. And St. Peter looked back down and he said, I got one question. He said, yes, sir. Am I a black zebra with white stripes or a white zebra with black stripes? And Peter sat and he thought for a moment. He went, I don't know, he said. You better go and ask the boss. So I'll let you in. But you've got to come back 
as soon as you get the answer, because I like to know the answer as well, Pete. St. St. Peter opened up the gates. Well, he didn't open up the big gates. There's a little door there that he opened up, and the zebra just hopped through the little door, and he closed it again. Now then, John, because you'll know this, because you're from Gloucestershire, everybody knows that every Sunday morning, and this happened to be a Sunday, God always goes down to the pub in heaven, which is called the Golden Heart. Now, to find the golden harp in heaven, you go through the pearly gates and you turn right. You go down a bit and you take the first left and there's an alley. And you follow that alley down and there's a pub down there called the Golden Harp. Now, in the Golden Harp, you can still smoke cigarettes and pipes because you're dead already. OK, so you don't, there's no smoking ban. You can smoke as much as you like in there, but they only serve Herefordshire cider. Because Herefordshire cider is the drink that everybody knows that God makes. It's like a nectar, and everybody knows that that's the only drink that God drinks. So he sat down there on a Sunday morning, and he reads the Sunday newspaper. He smokes a pipe like Gandalf, a great long thing, thin thing like that. And he's got a great big pot of cider, and he's drinking that. And that's where our zebra found him. And they had a bit of a conversation. And the zebra, as he promised, came back and sat down the other side of the pearly gates. And there was Peter. And Peter said, what did the boss say? And the zebra looked at him and he said, well, I'll tell you exactly what he said. But you're going to have to work out what it means. OK, so you went in and said, am I a black zebra with white stripes or a white zebra with black stripes? And God said, the colour of your skin makes no difference at all. It's what's inside that counts. OK, now I can hear a voice in the background, so someone's not muted. I think that's Anne. Anne, if you could mute yourself, please. Right. Mike, I just have to make a brief response because your story is so on point right now because of the resurgence that we're going through here in america um after kings i have a dream and other things we're going through this whole thing all over again so thank you your story touched a very special place in my heart and it's not heartburn thank you <laughs> thank you very much well like i said you know where it came from and how it got to me, and I've been telling it all these years, and my daughter is now 41. So, Susan, as promised, I come to you, because, and, and then you're going to tell your zebra story. I or don't is it the know. same one? I know it's not the same one. <laughs> not the same one. I don't know if I should say zebra or zebra, though. Who should I accommodate you? <laughs> Baba or, or, or Mike? <laughs> you do it in your language. Do okay. it in the way that you speak. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Okay. That's quite interesting because we have one say zebra. Zebra. Anyway. Before we go on, Ali, do you think you could mute, mute Anne, please? Right. I think we're okay. We're, 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 we're trying our best here. <laughs> okay. So I, right. I spent. Go on then, Susan. Over to you. Okay, I spent some time looking for an appropriate story, um, and I right. found four very interesting stories about zebras. One from Zimbabwe, uh, one from Ethiopia that I really loved, and then the well-known sand story where zebra has a fight with baboon. But I settled on a story from Venda. Venda is a little place in the northern province of Limpopo in South Africa, and their women are the storytellers. They tell the stories to give children a message. And this story is about how we deal with change. So many, many years ago, in a time when animals could speak, king of, the king of the animal kingdom, lions, was a very keen Mbali player. Mbali is a thumb or a finger piano. It's made with pins of metal and put on a box so that it can resonate. 
And King Lion was really good at this. At night, he would play his Mbali for the children, and everybody would have so much fun. And they would do the traditional dances as he played away. Like they did every day, Mum and Dad Lion went hunting to find food for the children. And on this particular day, just after they had gone, three very arrogant zebras arrived and they started kicking the two young lion cups about and said can you kick like this can you kick like this and the little lion cubs cowered and said no no we can't we can't and the zebra said well bring your father's mbali we want to make music and one zebra took the mbali and started playing, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. and the other two zebras danced, and they had loads of fun, and then all of a sudden, they ran off. That night, when Lion and his wife came home, after they had supper, Dad Lion said, please bring me my mbali, I want to make music. They brought the mbali, and he started to play. What's going on here, he said. Why is my Mbali out of tune? And the children said, we don't know, Dad, we don't know. And they cowered in the corner. I'm too tired to tune it now. And they all went to bed. The following day, the same thing happened. Mom and Dad left. The zebras arrived. They were extremely arrogant. They asked for the Mbali. They started dancing. They kicked the little lion clubs about all over the place until eventually they got tired and they left. That evening, when mom and dad came home, dad asked for the Mbali again and he said, Cubs, have you been messing about with my Mbali? It's completely out of tune. What is going on here? And the cubs, cubs, we don't know. But mom noticed that one of the little cubs had a bruise on his cheek. And she said, what is going on here? What is going on in my house? And the little cubs confessed. The following day, mom and dad went hunting again and then in trotted the arrogant zebras zebras sorry zebras same thing happened they kicked the poor cubs around asked for the mbali the one zebra started playing the mbali and said can your dad play like this can your dad play like this and the other zebra started dancing and said can your dad dance like this can your dad dance like this who's the best dancer who's the best Dancer, the little cub said, you are, you are. Just about as zebras were to leave. Out of the bushes rushed mom and dad, grabbed the, the zebras, scratched them all over and chased them away. That's why today, you know, the zebras live on the plains and the lions still eat them. Thank you. Well, it's a lovely story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, two completely different stories. Right. Right. So I'm going to go to Baba next, unless somebody's got another zebra story, zebra story, a zebra story, whichever. Have you got one, Mike? Mike, you go next, then after Mike, it's Baba. Okay. Okay. Here's a, a, a zebra story. It's a, it's a slightly different version from the one told on Tinker Tales <laughs> for my granddaughter. In the beginning, the creator had made all animals very, very similar. And one day he had several animals that come to him saying, I'd like to be different. I'd like something different. And so what he did was he set up a great cave. And in the cave, he had different coats and horns and could make animals bigger or smaller, different skins. And so all the animals were saying, come along, let's go. Oh, let's go and get special. And the zebra saying, actually, I'm a bit busy eating at the moment. I'll follow. 
And they all went off and the zebra carried on eating and he sort of was wandering their way, but eating as he went, and he's very slow. And suddenly a great big gray animal came towards him with long tusks and big ears and a trunk. And the zebra said, who on earth are you? And the animal said, it's me, your friend elephant. And she said, oh, you look really different. Because I went and got my gifts. And so she said, oh, I'll, I will go. Nom, nom, nom. But he was very greedy and he carried on eating. And then another animal came towards him. It was very tall with a great long neck and two nubby bits on its head. And it was, uh, had a patterned coat. And the animal said, hello, Zebra. And I said, your voice is familiar. And he said, it's, it's, it's me, Giraffe, your friend Giraffe. And he said, you look so different. But he was still green. He said, I will, I will come, but yom, 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 yom. he was still eating away. And he carried on wandering towards the cave. And he saw all these animals coming away from the cave and they were all looking different to what they had originally. And birds came out with wonderful plumage and different beaks. And he eventually he got to the cave and God said, oh, you're a bit late. And he looked around and said, all I've got left is this little black coat. And it's, I think it's probably too small for you, but you're so, so big. And as ever said, that'll do, that'll do. And he proudly put on the coat. If you imagine it's a bit like me trying to put on a 42 inch chest jacket. He got himself into this coat. And as he was going out the cave, he saw the most luscious bunch of grass. Oh, oh jump, jump, jump. And the coat split, 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 split. And that's why you've got the black stripes going down of the zebra's coat, and the white skin coming up from his tummy. And that's how the zebra got his stripes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. That was lovely. Right, that's lovely. Right. So we're going to go to Baba next. And with, after Baba, can we go to Teresa? Because I'm looking, I've, yeah, Teresa, I'm getting a thumb up from there. Right, so we're going to Teresa. Okay, Baba, over to you, mate. Thank you. I actually have a zebra story, but it's so <laughs> close to the zebra stories that have already been told. I'm going to tell something besides a zebra story. <laughs> However, my Spanish is not very good, so I will spare you my attempts to speak Spanish or a Spanish accent, whatever that means. But I'm going to tell the story about the fox and the armandello. And most of us know what an armandello is. And if you don't, very quickly go ahead and Google it while I'm telling the story. <laughs> so this story is um, this story is in the African diaspora. But I learned of it from having to teach about uh, Argentinian storytelling. So this is a once upon a time story, but I never say once upon a time, as we all note. There was a fox who was crafty, and there was an armandello who was more practical and down to earth. Now, the fox and the armandello were very good friends, go figure. But the fox was always kind of like, he always had to be on top. He always had to have one better. He all, you know, you if, if, if you had a blade of grass, he had to have two and his had to be longer, his had to be greener, his had to be grassier. So one day, the armandello decided that he was tired of doing nothing. No more time for doing nothing. He decided he was going to do a spot of farming. I don't know where that accent came from. He was going to do a spot of farming. So he immediately set out to work to build a fence around a plot of land. His friend, the fox, <laughs> was trying to figure out what the heck is he doing? What, why, why is he doing this? What, what, why is he working so hard instead of having fun in the sun like, like, like he was doing? Soon, the fox walked up to the armandillo and said, why are you building this fence? I mean, my, my dear best friend, my Rafiki, that's why he leave a friend. Well, why, why are you building this fence? Oh, uh, I want to grow some crops and earn some money, brother fox. 
earn some money. Hmm, and he thought to himself, why does he want to make some money? Why is he trying to become richer and more famous than me? Does he want to earn a good name from the other animals and get all the attention? Hmm. Or as they say in Fox language, <laughs> well, the fox did have more money. And the armandillo was working very hard. So the fox said, oh, my friend, my friend, my friend, my friend, my friend, my dear sweet Rafiki, um, why don't we go in this together? Now, I know that you built this fence and you're tilling your land, but surely you need seed money. Well, well, yes, I do. But I tell you what, I will give you the money for the seeds. <laughs> but here's the deal. When you grow your crops, I get to decide how we will divide them. I get to decide how the crops will be used. Now, the armandillo knew that the fox was up to something, and he didn't like the idea of the fox having final say on what would happen to the crops. But he didn't have any money for seeds. He had spent all his money building the fence and tilling the land, getting it ready to be seeded. So he said, okay, what did you have in mind? Well, this first crop, I will take everything that grows on top and you will take everything that grows beneath. Okay. I mean, what choice did he have? Hold on just a moment. My, my, okay. My screen was trying to turn off. Okay. And so the fox gave him the money. He bought the seeds and he planted. But he planted potatoes. That's it. Some of you got this. So when there came time for the harvest, you know, the top part of the potatoes grew up, but the potatoes were where? Underground. They were beneath. The fox was not happy. He collected all the, <laughs> the top growth. But the armandillo took off to town to sell all his potatoes. The fox said, you know, that, <laughs> that was not very nice of you. Uh, and I, I'm going to give you seed money for your next crop, but this time I get everything that's underground and you get everything that grows above ground. Uh, okay. Because after he had paid him back from the last loan, he didn't have money to buy new seeds. So he said, okay. So this time, the Armandetto planted wheat. Well, when it came time for the harvest, <laughs> you know what happened. The fox came around. The armandillo collected all the wheat, and the fox only had the roots that were left. Fox was not happy. He demanded repayment for all the money he had given armandillo, and armandillo repaid him. He said, now, I'm going to give you the money for the seeds again, but this time, I get everything that grows beneath and that grows above, and you get what grows between Armandillo said, thought to himself, this is not a good friend, but I have no money for seeds, so okay. And so he got the money and he went and bought seeds. Now, what do you think he planted this time around? If you think you know, unmute and let me know what you know. Ah. Oh. And Mike is very wisely not saying anything. Yay, Mike. No, Mike, I'm really kidding. <laughs> no, Mike, do you think you... Yeah, all right, all right. I, I, I think Mike knows, though. But I'm going to tell you what he did. This time around, he planted corn. Now, I have to make one bad pun. Because corn is amazing. And any of you who know about... Yeah, okay, moving on. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> so he planted corn. So when the fox came around, the armandillo took all the corn and left the stalks 
and the roots for Fox. Fox was not happy. And one more bad pun, collecting all the corn would lead me ordinarily into an eerie story, but that's another tale. <laughs> he collected all the corn, the Fox was furious. And from that day forth, he would do no business with the Armandello. But the Armandello made more than enough money to pay back Fox and to buy his future seeds. Now you see, Foxy you may think, Foxy you may be, but greed is never a good thing. It never looks good on ye, ye, or thee. So be like the Armandello and get on the ball, see, Armandello, <laughs> and learn how to be crafty and wise and always be fair, least your comeuppance come back to you. Asante, Asante Sana, thank you very much. <laughs> So in, over in the Celtic lands here, in the British Isles and British and Irish Isles and things, we know that's a Jack story. Ah, oh, okay. And it's Jack in the fairies, and Jack in the boggle works, or whatever. And but the third time, Jack says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'll plant, you can have everything that's under the ground, you can have everything that's above the ground up to three foot high, and I'll have it the rest. Ah. And the Book of Words agrees with that, and he goes and plants stick beans. Now, you call them runner beans sometimes, the ones that go up the sticks, right? right. So all the crop is above three foot. So Jack had all those, and the Book of Words didn't get anything, and he got crosser and crosser. So I think sometimes the, we call them string beans, too. String beans would be another good name for yeah, Right, yes. that's okay. Right, Teresa, we're going to you, and then we're going to Alicia from the Highlands of Scotland, and then we're going to Diana. Now, she, uh, what was your face, Aisha? Have I said your name, Molly? <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm always, I've got something. I'm going to call you Miss Dixon. <laughs> right. So, Teresa next, then Miss Dixon, <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Have you got a second name? Anyway, we'll go to Teresa. Go on, that to you, mate. Okay. Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you all again. Um, I've got a couple of poems this evening, um, one of which I've written since our last conversation about the zebra zebra. So, but I'll leave that till last. <clears throat> and I got reminded of this poem. I wrote this in 2007 in the place that I lived at the time. And I had to go back there last Sunday well, nearby, so I thought I'd go and have a little look round because it's been a long time since I lived there. And I reminded myself of this poem. And uh, it's a bit of a narrative one, so I thought it would work quite well here. Right, there's six of us tonight for tea. Shall we get fish, chips and mushy peas from Napoli? Off goes Rob on Mike's new bike to Chloe, Megan and Lauren's delight. Sadly, he is back too soon. The shouts of joy soon turn to gloom. It's shut. How strange. They're away. We'll have to get fish chips and mushy peas another day. Wait, though, says Chloe to her daddy. Can we get Miss Phipps and Pushy Cheese from the kebabby? Well, can we? Shall we? What shall we do? I don't know, love. It's over to you. Let's go for it. Let's give them a try. We can always rethink if it all goes awry. Oh, fish not bad and quite a size. Good value for money, that's a surprise. I'm halfway through my fillet of fish. It turns out to be quite a dish. But oh, what's that? The sirens blare. I have to abandon my plate affair. Closer, louder, then closer still, the fire engine's coming up the hill. There's three of them then, climbing higher and higher. Oh, good Lord, the kebab shop's on fire! 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 The kebab shop's on fire! We start to run and so do a few plumes of black smoke, but what do you do? Is there someone inside? No! We're all reassured. What a shame. All that renovation. I hope they're insured. A punter from Coral came over all moral. That's payback for Glasgow, that is. 
Don't talk such tosh, said the van man from Bosch. I heard in the co-op, it's true. Was a fag on the seat by a thug on the beat who looks pretty much just like you. Four fisticuffs broke out. Someone made a, gi a glib joke about a girl on her bike and her saddle. Then up came this bloke as we laughed on the green and said, This is what life's like in Braddle. It was the chip fat caught light, said the geezer from Lock Tight. No, I heard it was the kebab meat. Whatever the cause, it's reflective to pause as the flames belch and lick in the heat. More folk appeared. And then more folk appeared. There soon was a mighty big crowd. Stand back out of the way. Get that tape round today, said the man with the white hat out loud. He's in charge, said Ma Quinn to her youngest son, Finn. You can tell by the way that he walks. Watch him carefully, son, because his trousers undone. His willy might fall out when he talks. The hose pipes are out and up goes a big shout. There's a man at the window upstairs. See the mess of that flat and the smoking chip fat. Poor chap, what a state, there's no doubt. The high street is jammed and the number five bus takes a detour to add to the chaos. Our Jenny is stuck. Oh, it's just our bad luck, she says with a small dose of pathos. A policeman arrives to direct the traffic. Soon Bedlam is out on the street. A car shuffles here, a van moves out there to untangle this web's quite a feat. Susie spots Mrs Taylor, goes over to nail her about an earlier family dispute. She's sidetracked, however, by her close friend named Heather, who points out a lad that's quite cute. Fight, gossip and claim is the name of the game and the buzz on the green starts to grow. Someone gave up the shout, what a lovely night out, shall we do it again like tomorrow? The young boss arrives and to our surprise he's got a fresh bump on his car. With a new wife in tow, what a day he will know, it's a way off till one on a par. The crowd starts to go as the sun hits the lakes and things quieten down for a bit. We make our way back to the tea that we left. But the dogs ate the fish every bit. A cry from next door brings us all rushing out. What shenanigans happening next? Whilst out on the rove, left the chips on the stove. <laughs> Poor chap, as we laughed, looked quite vexed. As our chuckles died down, I put on my nightgown and I sit in the charred, smelly breeze. Oh, what tales for tomorrow of laughter and sorrow. I must get my pen out to tease. In the dark, with a torch, men work into the night to secure a warped, broken, burnt shop. Count your blessings, you lot, because you could lose the plot when life catches us so on the hop. I hear Ali's kebabs up the hill in Bradville. Did a rip-roaring trade in Kingsfold. Did so well, I heard tell, that of roses he smells and his trailers all lined out with gold. That was lovely, thank you. <clears throat> and now I've got to just show you a photo because... When we talked about zebras a couple of weeks ago, I've had a lot of distractions from then. But I was my niece is moving house on, on Monday and I found this furniture shop that was doing a load of bargains. And this, this photo is of the zebra that I found. <laughs> and he's like some sort of decor. So I wrote a, po a poem, a zebra poem, and it's called, There's a Zebra Climbing Through That Wall. <laughs> There's a zebra climbing through that wall. And I seem to recall that this is quite unusual for a zebra. And I asked myself, 
what could be his intent? What is meant by this animist invasion into the realms of human space? Is he in a race? Has he set the pace? Or is he in a chase, escaping from a ferocious lion? Perhaps he's had enough of grassland and savannah. Maybe it's his manner to drop by unexpectedly, which wouldn't suit me. And I wonder in whose house he would make his bed. And what if he's led a whole herd of other zebras? My living room would get crowded pretty quick. It would only take a tick and it would really bother me if I had to try and see across a zebra stripy black and white landscape. So I'm afraid, Mr Zebra, you must stay climbing through that wall that you're on. The end. <laughs> Right, so we're going to go to the northern parts of the, of the British Isles, which are the Highlands. So that's them pretty much, there's not much south, there's not much further north than where you come from. So um, now then, I'm going to have one more go at it, so I'm probably going to get it wrong. Alicia, no? <laughs> um, almost, it's in almost. <laughs> Have you got a what's your what's your name in the in the Gaelic language? Is it the same? Uh, I don't think it's a Gaelic name. Um, I am named after my mum's best friend, who was Dutch, and she was called Ilse, which is spelled Elsa. I L S E. And I'm also right. named after an island, which is sort of in the west coast, down south. That is Ilse Craig Island, and it's got a lighthouse on it. It's quite nice. Right, I'll, say, I'll look it up, I promise. <laughs> I, I hate getting people's name, I, I can't apologise enough. So just get started, okay? okay. And then we're going to Diana Hello. next, okay? Uh, okay. okay. Hello everyone. Um, I apologise for my hair being all in a mess today. <laughs> I was at work and got absolutely soaked, so... Um, it's all wet and drying at the moment. So I thought that I might as well tell a story that goes with that a bit. I apologise if you've heard the story before, but it begins, as all the best stories do, a long, long, long time ago. And this story begins in Cameroon. It's a Cameroonian folktale, and it begins a long, long, long time ago with a girl called Mbango. Now Mbango, she was, oh, she was a lovely girl and she had such a happy family. She had a, a wonderful father and a wonderful mother, but because this is a fairy tale, when she was just a young girl, her mother sadly died. And because this is a fairy tale, the dad married again and married a horrible, horrible woman, a horrible, stepmother who had again because this is a fairy tale a daughter of her own and she treated the two girls very very differently. Mabango was made to do all the work around the cottage she'd be sorting out the dinner she'd be fetching the water she'd be doing all the odd jobs all the mending and fetching and carrying and stepmother's own daughter why she'd just be sitting around all day, eating the nicest food, wearing the nicest clothes. And when Mabango's father eventually died, things just got worse and worse and worse. Now one day, one hot, warm day in the summer, Mabango was taking the great big urn, the great big water urn down to the river, which was the first job she did every morning when she woke up. She'd go and take the urn down to the river and fill it. But today, as she knelt down by the river side and bent to scoop the water up in her urn, she dropped it. And away it fell down the river and it twisted and turned with the tide and fell, fell quite quickly with the current down and down and down in Mabango while she was running. She was running along the riverbank because she had to get the urn. And she ran so fast, she soon lost sight of the wee cottage behind her. And she kept running until the urn appeared at a whirlpool and it bobbed up 
once, twice, three times, circled around and around and vanished down beneath the surface. And because Mabangal was more scared of her stepmother than she was of the water, she held her nose, took in a deep breath and dived down, down, down into the whirlpool. But when she reached the bottom of the river, she found something she wasn't quite expecting. Why, above her was the river water rushing past and she could see fish and little bits of seaweed and she could see the sunlight glinting through the water. But here, she was dry. And there were little houses down beneath the river in this little pocket of open air and there were little houses with their little cottages and little pigs and little sheds and there were people coming in and out of all the house gates and she walked down the road and she saw an old woman an old hunched over woman who was holding her urn and she said excuse me um excuse me but that that's my urn you're holding there and do you think I could have it back because I quite need it because my stepmother would want, want some water today Ah, said the old woman. Uh, you, you see, I'd like to give it to you, but, well, I don't have an urn and, and I'd really like it. And I did find it. Okay, said so my bangle. Well, how about if I do a day's work for you, if I do a whole day's work for you, and then you give me my urn after that. And the old woman said that seemed fair and that's what my bangle did. She did an entire day's work for the old woman. She swept the floor, she cleaned out the pig shed, she cooked, she baked, she polished and brushed and cleaned absolutely everything. Until the, the old woman's wee cottage was absolutely spotless. And she was just about to leave when the old woman said, hey, excuse me, would, would, would you mind sharing a meal with me? You've done such a good job, I'd like to show my appreciation. And Mabango, she was a polite, polite young woman, and she said, yes, of course, yeah, I'd like to share a meal with you. And so they sat down and the old woman brought two great plates of food. And Mabango looked down and it was pig dung. It was pig dung. It was great steaming piles of pig dung sitting on the plate. And Mabango looked at it and, ah, oh, she couldn't eat that. But, but she was a polite young girl. And she'd done things nearly as awful for her stepmother, who she didn't even like. And she did like the old woman a lot. And maybe, maybe just a little bit wouldn't be too bad. So she got her fork. And she moved it slowly towards the great steaming vats of pigdom. And she got a tiny, tiny bit on the end and brought it slowly towards her mouth and closed her eyes. But when it touched her lips, it became the most delicious stew she'd ever eaten, the most delicious food she'd ever had in her entire life. And she ate up the rest of the great big bowl without any problem at all. And when she'd finished eating, the old woman said, why, thank you. You, you are a, quite a lovely young woman and I'd like to show my thanks. So here you go. And she gave her three eggs. When you get home, you need to break these eggs on the floor of your cottage and your life will change for the better. Thank you, said Mabango. And she left the old woman, she left the cottage behind her. She walked down the street until she saw the whirlpool swirling above her. And then she swam upwards, 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 upwards until she burst the surface and scrambled up onto the bank and then ran holding the urn all the way home to her cottage. And when she got home, her stepmother began to yell and scream and rage. Why have you been missing an entire day? You've not done any of your chores. What happened to the water? But Mabango didn't listen to her. She broke the first egg on the floor and gold chains fell out. She broke the second egg on the floor and rubies fell out. And she broke the third egg on the floor and silver coins fell out. Where did you get those eggs? said her stepmother. And 
why Mabango told her exactly where she got them? Mm, said the stepmother. I think we'll need some more. You, she pointed to her own daughter. You need to go down to this whirlpool and see if you can find some more eggs. So the other daughter set off with the urn running down to the whirlpool. And just like Mabango had, she threw the urn down into the whirlpool and dived down after it and found just as Mabango had, underwater village. And she saw the old woman standing there holding the urn. Oi, she said, that's mine that is, give it back. Okay, said the old woman and handed her back the urn. But before you leave, would you like to share some dinner with me? I'd, I'd, I'd be honoured. All right, she said, I am hungry. And so she sat down in the old woman's cottage and the old woman put a plate of pig dung pig dung i'm not eating pig dung who do you think you are you disgusting old woman just give me my eggs and then i'll go and the old woman handed her the three eggs and told her to break it on the cottage floor and the sister well she she left she walked away she swam up through the whirlpool she scrambled up onto the bank and ran all the way home. And when she got to the cottage, she broke the first egg on the floor and snakes slithered out. She broke the second egg on the floor and scorpions slithered out. She broke a third egg on the floor and thousands of spiders crawled out. And the snakes and scorpions and spiders chased the stepmother and the stepsister into the deep dark woods where they were never ever heard of again. And Mabango, she lived a very long and happy life. She was polite, she was kind, and she often went to visit the old woman in the whirlpool. And that is my story. That was a lovely story well uh, told, Elsha. Now, I want you to make me a promise. Now, you're going to make it to me and to John and to Baba and all the old people that you're looking at. Never apologise for telling a story. You don't need to, you tell them well enough. If they've heard it the first time, they'll be happy to sit and listen to it again. All right? And right. normally, in a, in, in a group of people, only 10% will have heard it again. The other 90% haven't heard it again, and they'll be enjoying it. But just never apologise for it. Just get on and get started, okay? Put your hand up, hey, as you promise. Put your hand up, as you promise. Put your hand up, as you promise. Thank you. Right, now we're going to, no, Baba, we're going to Diane next. Okay, <laughs> okay, mate. All right, Hi. Diane, and then we're going to Elaine. And Heather, don't you think I know exactly, well, you, you've moved now, but I want you to be last, Heather. So Anne Digam, uh, are you going to Dignam? And where she's gone. Okay, so we'll go to Diane. Okay. You're going to be last, Heather. You're going to tell the last story. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Diane, over to you. Hi. Um, I'm Diana and I stay in a small village outside Aberdeen, um, oh. not too far from Ailsa. <laughs> so, um, right, I've got a story that I love and um, I've told it quite a number of times on different occasions, but every time I tell it, it always feels a bit different for me, like all good stories should. Now, they say that the well is still there, the well. Well, that's where it all started. I mean, it's all overgrown now. Well, this did happen hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So they say. And this is where they met. Janet was there. She stayed in the castle on the hill up at Carter Hall with her father, the Laird. And she had a very privileged upbringing. She was an only child and all things were lavished upon her. Freedom as well. I mean, she was a smart girl, so if she wanted to do something that wasn't considered the right thing, she would find a way, like all teenagers would. She was about 17 years old, and she loved to go to Carter Hall Woods, where this well was in a clearing. But she wasn't really supposed to go, because there were all sorts of tales about Carter Hall Woods. Things about people disappearing. A young lad called Tom Lynn had disappeared such a long, long time ago. But Janet remembered. She remembered 
about Tamlin and all the Ferrari at the time and how he'd, he'd gone out on his pony with his uncle, the Earl of Roxburgh, hunting, and he'd fallen behind. And, well, if only he hadn't, if only he hadn't fallen off. Well, falling off wasn't quite so bad, but falling onto a grassy knoll, a grassy knoll. He didn't remember, of course, he'd been rendered unconscious and he'd been taken down into the depths of the earth below with all these passageways and that's where he had wakened. And of course, it was amazing. This rabbit warren of tracks, the whirring of the wings, the magic in the air, the lights. And in the distance, there was this fairy queen very beautiful, with gossamer wings, gold, silver, russet brown, and so much power. Everyone had to do her bidding. Well, like I say, they met at the well, the Janet, and she didn't know it at the time. She just picked her rose by the well, and she heard this voice. This voice that said, what are you doing picking that? That belongs to the fairy queen. And Janet, Janet, all independent and of noble birth, was totally taken aback. But when she looked round, she couldn't see him. She couldn't see the voice where it came from. But then she looked up and he jumped down off a branch. And there stood this 17 year old handsome lad with blonde hair. And Janet wondered who this was, who this could be, talking about the fairy queen like that. And snippets of long ago came back about Tamlin, and she wasn't sure, but then they started to talk. And she found his world so intriguing. He was a guardian of the forest for the fairy queen, and she couldn't believe how wonderful his time with the fairies must be. And so it was to begin with. It was wonderful because everything was new and there was so much to find out and there was so much magic. But then, then came the control and you had to do exactly as you were told. And there wasn't any way around that. Not that Tom Lynn could work out on his own. But here he was in front of her. They met quite a number of times after that over the summer. And to begin with, they just exchanged stories. But then it became obvious that Tamlin wasn't happy. And Janet felt for him. He'd been taken from the human world and transported to a fairy world they didn't understand. And he'd been imprisoned there for seven, almost seven years. And what was he to do? He didn't really know, but the more they talked, the more they thought maybe Maybe if she helped him, maybe he could get away from this domination by the fairy queen. Maybe he could have his own life. And the seven years were almost up. And that was a magical time for the lowering of the veil, the time when things can pass from one world to another, from the fairy world back to the human world, perhaps. But nothing happens if all you do is think, perhaps. It only happens if you venture, if you actually believe and think and try and decide that with all your heart you're going to do something about this. And that's what Janet decided to do. Because now summer was passing and the leaves were falling, red and golden and brown, and there was a bit of a chill in the air. And the 31st of October, when the fields would be down, weren't that far away. So on that particular night, Janet had gone back after meeting Tamlin in the afternoon. She'd gone back to the castle. And there they're preparing this Halloween party and all the food. And everybody's wearing fancy dress. But she slipped away and she had her black cloak on. She put the hood up. She had a little lantern, but it didn't give an awful lot of light. And she found it difficult to find the well. But eventually she did. And she knew that when she did, she would cower behind a bush 
and she would just have to wait. And all the time her heart is racing and she's wanting this time to be over because she's scared and she's, she's desperate. But she has to wait. And then in the distance, and a bit more. And then eventually she sees this beautiful black horse with the knight sitting astride it. And behind him, all the fairies with bow and arrows looking very intent indeed. And behind that, a brown horse, a beautiful brown chestnut mare with a knight astride her. And behind that, there were all these fairies with spears pointing, poised. And then what she was waiting for, it was a white horse, it was Tam Lin. And he had one glove off, one glove on, just like they decreed. But she still had to wait. She had to wait till he was right close up near. And her breathing was heavy and labored. But she managed, she reached out and pulled him down. And then all she could think to do was wrap her arms around him because she knew that the fairy queen would not give up without a fight. And then almost instantaneously, he turned. He wasn't Tom Lynn anymore. He was a snake. And he was coiling himself round her. And she couldn't do anything about it. And she just wanted it to pass. And then, then it was a wildcat. A wildcat with fierce claws, sharp, digging into her and spitting and hissing. And then again, it changed. But this time a swan with a large beak and flapping wings, overpowering her. But Janet knew she could just hold on. If she could just hold on, she didn't know if she could, but she would try. And then, then it was a stag. So she gripped hold of the stag, the, the, the antlers, and pulled and tried to keep them away from her. But she was getting weaker and more tired. And then there was this wolf with white teeth opening his jaws, coming towards her. But then she managed to grab one of the legs and she just held on and held on. And then like a bad dream, it was all over and she was holding this branch. And this branch had lights on it. It was, uh, it had been lit. And she felt there was something special about this branch. She was holding it. <coughs> when the fairy queen, because she had lost her power. And so Janet put the burning torch into the well and heard it go. And then she just waited and she didn't know what would happen. She was finding it hard to get over the shock of what had just happened. But then she heard it. It was footsteps coming up the foot, uh, the, the bits jutting out on the side of the wall of the well inside it. Somebody coming up. And then she saw this mess of wet blonde hair and the smile. Tam Lynn, had they done it? They must have done it. The fairy queen's power had gone from his life. And there he was, standing there, smiling in front of her. So she, she went over and they rejoiced together. They couldn't quite believe they both managed it. And then they walked over towards the castle where the Halloween party was. And as they, they walked, they were so overjoyed. They were definitely on a natural high. But then... Tam Lin had this odd feeling in his stomach. He couldn't quite understand that it wasn't butterflies. It wasn't nerves. It was hunger. And as soon as they got to that castle, he would do something about that because he hadn't felt human hunger for such a long time. And he was looking forward to the feast at the party. Thank you. Oh.
You are very welcome to come back here anytime you like. That was fine, and thank you very, very much, sir. So you say you came from Aberdeen? You're, you're yes. In uh -huh. So did you know, um, my friends out there would have been Stanley Robinson, who's sadly not there, and Bob Pegg? I know, I know of Stanley. I never, I, I met him a couple of times, but he was sort of, he wasn't doing much storytelling then. He wasn't quite so well then. But I, and I've read a lot of his, I've got Exodus to Alford and I've heard all the great tales. A lot of the storytellers at the group I go to know him very, or knew him very well. <laughs> well, I'm the room I'm sat in, he stayed in. Right, yeah. yeah. When he came down to England and joined us here, he actually stayed there a long, long time ago, when, before I was old enough to have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right, so we're going to go to Elaine, um, and then I think that I'm, I'm saving Heather York for last, and she tells me she's going to tell a shortish one, which you tell is, tell, take as much time as you like, Heather, that's fine. Elaine, I'm going to pass it to you. I'm just going to have to nip while you're telling the first few minutes because I need to go to the loo, that's all. So don't, I am listening, don't worry about that, okay? <laughs> oh, well, we'll just tell the best bits while he's not here, will we? <laughs> this is a true story. Don't tell him when he comes back. But it has the elements of a fairy tale. We move right up to Shetland to the house of Busta. Now it's true because this very clever lady wrote the story of it. Now it starts off in this grand gateway and a beautiful young woman is walking across it with the laird. He is so handsome and yummy. Mm. She has made a very good match, good looking and lots of money. Just what our mother wanted. So he carries her over the threshold and he's very pleased with himself as well. Not only does she have the most beautiful golden hair and the big blue eyes and the petiteness of a little lady. And she's dressed as though she's come out of a hat box, even though it's freezing in Shetland. She will soon learn to dress otherwise. Ah, oh, however, we're at the start of the story. And we know it's true because the house still exists, still to this day, but it's a big posh hotel now. Not so then. Thomas carries his beautiful bride over the threshold and she's very, very nervous. Oh, she's not used to such a grand place. Will she mind her manners? Will everybody think that she's good enough to be the laird's wife. Oh, so she goes upstairs to get herself all pampered down and lovely looking for the meal. And Thomas just looks at her and he thinks, oh, she's gorgeous. She's just fine. So we've set the scene. It's very fairy tale like. He has to go away in business and he brings her back presents. He brings her back a beautiful, beautiful sewing box. Because poor dear, she keeps on losing her thimble and her thread and her scissors. And oh, he finds that so sweet. So he buys this sewing box. My dear, you won't lose your things now. And he's always thinking about how he can buy a lovely presents. The next present, well, it's a bit bigger, doesn't you know, he couldn't quite fit that in his pocket or in his bag or anything. It was a pony and off they would ride together. Oh, they had such grand times. Well, soon, as all good stories go, she's in the family way. But sweet dear, she doesn't even realise until her personal maid, Martha. She says, oh, Martha, Martha, I'm ailing so. What can the matter be? Well, says Martha, you're with child, your ladyship. With child? Yes, you're going to have a baby. <gasps> oh, how wonderful. Oh, but I don't know anything about having babies. Will you tell me, Martha? Martha says, aye, aye. I'm a bit of a howdy wife, amongst other things. I'll, I'll make sure you're all right. Well... Elizabeth soon got the hang of it because she had 14 children. 
14 children. That's enough to keep anybody going. So you would think this is a lovely story, but, but, didn't the scarlet fever come to Shetland? And one by one, by one, by one, it picked off the children. Four, five, <gasps> Elizabeth and Thomas were bereft, but it stopped then and the other children survived, including the firstborn, her beloved John. Oh, if she had John, everything would be all right. But her husband said something to her. He said, well, we just have to respect the will of God, my dear. God, she thought. God, and something inside her hardened into a steel God. Well, I'll make my own luck from now on, never mind God taking my children off me. Oh, she grew cold and hard, and Thomas didn't hardly recognise his lovely Elizabeth because she was hard. And he thought, well, I know, I know what might make her leap. She won't miss her girls so much. He'd heard that his good friend, unfortunately, had succumbed to the scarlet fever leaving two daughters. Now, surely, surely, if Elizabeth had another two girls in the house, that would cheer her up a bit. Well, you'd think so, wouldn't she? But I was thinking about Elsa's story, about how one was picked on by the stepmother. Well, as soon as Elizabeth got these girls into the house, under the pretense of, oh yes, dear, I'll make sure they get an education. They'll be my maids, she thought. How dare they be alive when her gorgeous daughters had died? Oh, she had such venom and spite inside her, especially towards the one called Barbara. Because wasn't it Barbara, her beautiful daughter that had died? Oh, she hated this Barbara. She couldn't stand the sight of her. She made her go and stay up in the garret upstairs so that she would only see her when she had to come down and perform her duties. Education? Poof. I've not got time to educate that girl. I need her as my maid. Well, it didn't stop there. Elizabeth found out that Barbara had been knitting the most beautiful little stockings. She got her in, she said, how dare you waste your time knitting stockings? What are you knitting stockings for? but I have to send some money to my poor mother. Your mother? It's not your mother that's keeping you. It's me. I'll have the money. Well, poor Barbara. She then had to start clearing out the stables in any spare time she had. John, the beloved of Elizabeth, he had an eye for Barbara and he hated the way she was being treated. And he just grew to love her, whatever she did. And he found her cleaning out the stables. He says, no, 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 no. I won't have you cleaning out the stables to send money, money to your mother. I'll have a word with my mother. Well, that made Elizabeth worse, knowing that her beautiful son, who could do so well for himself, what is that piece of maid? Oh! No, she couldn't thole the thought. No, I'm not having it. I'm not having it. I want you never to speak to her. Okay, she can send money to her mother, but you must stop speaking to her. Well, John wasn't keen on that idea, and nor was Barbara particularly. So they used to sneak away and meet at night when all had gone to bed. Well, this couldn't go on for very long. They knew they'd be discovered. And Elizabeth's treatment of Barbara became worse and worse. He says, John said, my love, Barbara. And he took her by the hand. He said, we must find a way to be together. I know. We'll get married in secret. How can we do that? You leave it to me, said John. And he spoke to his mother and he said, mother, 
I feel I'd like to visit Ant, just on the other side of the island. We'll row around and we'll make a day's trip of it. I'll take the boys and you can have a day to yourself. And I thought that, you know, so that you could get peace. I know you don't like Barbara around all the time. I thought perhaps her and her sister could also go off and visit their mother. And then you could have the whole house to yourself because father's away. Oh, that would be quite nice, John. Yes, I, I, I think I'd like that. And so it was planned. So they left separately. John went off rowing with the boys. But they wanted to get up to some shenanigans. And the shenanigans were going to be their undoing, as you'll see. Because they started to shoot the seals as they were in the boat. Now, that's never a good idea in, in Scotland because we have stories. But I'm not going to tell you one of them. I'm only going to tell you what happened to the boys. Well, they got to where they were going after shooting the seals. They were lucky. They got to the auntie's house. Of course, it had been arranged that aunt and uncle were going to be away and there was a secret marriage to take place. So Elizabeth was there in all her finery. Her sister was there as her best maid. The maids were in on the secret and they put a lovely spread out. Beautiful. They had a lovely day, but of course, they had to return separately. So John had given Barbara a beautiful engraved wedding ring, but you must wear it round your neck, not on your finger yet. Yes, darling, yes. And I will take the wedding certificate and present it to my mother. Then she can't deny we're married and she can't stop us going away and staying together in the wee cottage on the estate. Oh, that would be wonderful. Wasn't Barbara's dream just going to come true? No. Because on the way back, as the boys were rowing back, the seals wanted to get their revenge for their poor relatives that had been shot. So they all went under the boat, they lifted the boat, and they overturned it. Everyone drowned. They all drowned. The final boys and Elizabeth's family. Barbara returned to the shore. She said, what's, what's going on? Oh, 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 Barbara, oh, Barbara, don't look there. But it was too late. She'd already looked and she saw her beautiful John face down on the beach, dead as a stone. She turned him over to kiss his face and embrace him one last time. And out from his jacket fell the wedding certificate, the certificate of marriage. Well, Elizabeth, when she heard the story, was having none of it. It's a lie. It's a complete lie. My John wouldn't do anything like that. But it soon became apparent that he had because Barbara was with child. Now, stealing children is not attractive, but Elizabeth had grown hard. She let Barbara nurse the child and let him grow a bit, but she was so jealous, intensely, insanely jealous of the love that mother and son had for each other. She couldn't stand it. If she couldn't have it, Barbara wasn't going to have it, so she banished her. She sent her away. And the poor boy, Gideon, waved as he saw his mother go. And that was the second last time that Barbara saw her boy. He grew up, guided by Elizabeth, who was quite a loving granny, although she had the hardness in her heart. She still loved that boy like she loved her son. But he wanted to see his mother, and he did one last time when he was 17, when he finally escaped the clutches of his grandmother. He managed to visit his mother just one last time, and they had a final embrace. And very soon after, poor Barbara died. And 
he was so, so sad that she'd had such a hard life and he could never make it any better for her. So this fancy posh hotel, it is said that the ghost of Barbara still roams around the corridors looking for a baby boy that was stolen from her. And that's the end of the story. And it's true. Wow. That was lovely, Elaine. Thank you. So uh, where are you geographically? Where do you live? I stay just outside Edinburgh. Oh. It's, it's oh. my son stays in Shetland. Yeah. Well, years ago, back in the 90s, there was a Shetland fiddler that used to come and travel, do a tour in the autumn in, in, around England, around the folk festivals. And he came to our storytelling club one day, and he just sat there and his father was a fisherman. And he just told these stories that we'd never heard of before from the Shetland. And it, it was beautiful. How, how, how they rowed the garrow down and big fishes that sat at the back of the boats and protected them and things like that. It was wonderful. Right. So I think everybody's done something that wants to do something. So I'm going to finish up tonight by making a promise to you all and to John himself. There's been a lot of talk down here about a fellow called Stanley Robinson, who, like I said, was a friend of mine, and we met at Whitby Folk Week. And the stories he told about the snakes and the vampires. Now, I've been racking my brain, and there is one that's come to mind. And uh, Amy Douglas, who's been talking to me about this as well, and one or two others. So I'll tell it in a fortnight's time, John. I'll start off by telling it, if I may take that privilege for once. And I'll start by this, because I remember the first line. And the first line goes like this. For when all the snakes in Scotland, and it gets to the, the winter times. So for the winter times in England start in October and November. But in Scotland, they start earlier. For they, their winter starts in September. They all gather together in a stone wall and they create a nest of snakes. And they, they all get together to keep warm for the winter. And they find a little hole in the south facing wall and they all gather there together. And the only people who know, or the only things that know where the nest of snakes are, are the little black and white collie dogs, the female ones. But when it comes to that time of the month, the little collie dog will turn into a snake, check that its relations are all okay. That's how it starts. Okay, so we're going to go to Heather now. And Heather's going to finish her up. She's going, she says she's going to tell a really long story. It's going to take three quarters an hour. That's <laughs> fine by me. I'm sat here with a beer. I can sort of change my so I can look outside. What she actually said was she was going to play a small a tune on a harp and tell a short story. <laughs> yeah. Tell you all. Thanks, Mike. Well, if you're going to be telling a Stanley story in a fortnight, I can always bring a Stanley story along as well, as you well know. I, I knew Stanley from childhood. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, uh, but this is just a wee tiny story from the Western Isles of Scotland. There's two versions of this story. Uh, one that comes from the Isle of Skye and one from Egg. And it's the story of how music came to the Western Isles. And so it happened a long time long, long time ago, back in the mists of time, there was a widow woman who lived in a wee cottage with her one son. And that laddie, oh, he loved the sea. He would spend all his days, as unless he was needed on the croft, he would spend his days wandering along the shore. He would gather driftwood, he would collect limpets and whelks and other shellfish and sometimes he would go fishing but he just loved the sound that the waves made, the way the wind brought the sea, the smell of the sea and the sound of the birds up in the sky and, and the seals and the other creatures of the sea it made him so happy when he was on the beach. And this particular day, 
he suddenly saw out there something bobbing up and down in the waves. The sea often brought him gifts, and so he watched as this object came closer and closer. He waded out into the shallows and he grabbed hold of it. And as he brought it out of the water, the most amazing sound came from this object. He couldn't believe it. He had never heard anything like it. Oh, it was just incredible. He, he couldn't stop listening and what, looking at this thing and thinking, oh, this is the most beautiful thing he'd ever heard, beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And he took it home. But it went silent. And he sat with this object and he tried, he tried to make it sound exactly the way he had heard it when he took it out of the sea. But he couldn't make it sound the same. And he sat with this day after day trying to get this magical sound out of it. And he stopped eating, he stopped sleeping, he just was obsessed. His mother didn't know what to do. She tried everything, but she started getting really worried about him. And she knew she had to do something to help her son. So she went to the wise man on the island. Now he was wise, but he also dabbled in the black arts. And when she told him what had happened to her son, he listened and he smiled and he said, ah, I can help you. You've got two choices. I can make your son forget about this object. They never is bothered by it again. Or I can give him the gift of music, being able to get music from, from it. But if I grant you that second one, you have to give me your soul in exchange. <sighs> what was she to do? She thought, she went out for a walk and she thought about this very hard. She thought about, about her son and, and she, oh, she didn't know what to do. But eventually she decided, she made it her decision, she went back to the, to the wise man and she said, I want my son to have the gift of music. I know that it will mean so much to him. So I will gladly give you my soul in exchange for that gift. And so it was. The old woman walked home that night and as she walked, she could hear the music coming from the house. And it was like nothing she'd ever come across before. She'd never heard music like this. People sang, yes, and whistled, but there was never before had been music. And she saw something amazing as she walked along because she was walking along the shore and she saw all these seals coming out of the water and pulling themselves onto the shore moving towards the music and there were otters and and birds of all kinds herons and and all sorts of different birds from the sea were coming swooping down to land on the shore and to move towards this music. And then even from the forest came the deer and the other wee creatures pouring out of the forest. And 
her son had been given this amazing gift. But eventually he discovered what his mother had sacrificed so that he could have this gift. And that is why the music of Scotland and the Highlands of Scotland especially sometimes can be so heartbreaking because when he first found out that his mother had given her soul so that he could have that gift, the cry of anguish that came from him. And that is why the music is so full of sorrow at times, as well as great joy. And that's the story from the Highlands. Oh, that was beautifully well told, Evan. Thank you very much. I was going to ask you, I think everybody's done something that wants to do something now, and the only other person, John, is you, and I think we decided you were doing anything this week. Is that right? That is perfectly right. I'll, 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 I'll do something next next time. I, right. I'll, all, I, all I'll do is, when you've finished, I'll make the announcements of what is coming up. Right, well, we'll, we'll finish just in a minute. I've just got one question to, to ask uh, Heather or Aisha now. I think the other... Oh, Elaine's still here. Uh, D Duncan Williamson was a friend of mine as well. I just know all the ones who died. Don't worry about it. it you, you'll live for ages knowing me. Don't worry about it. Um, he used to tell a story about a tune that he used to play on a tin whistle that meant that the seals would come to the beach. And in those days, I didn't play music. Do you know that tune? Do you know a tune that will bring the seals to the beach? That's a famous tune. I don't know it by heart, so I'd have to find it for you, Mike, but I could send it to you or I could play it to you next time. Right. No, absolutely. No, there's no need to chase it. Out. I just wondered if it was a common one. I, always, I, I got the feeling when he was talking about it, everybody knew it in Scotland, but I've mentioned it to one or two other people, but they didn't seem to know. So do you know this tune, Lane? And uh, Aisha, do you, have you heard this tune? I think I've heard of it. But um, I, I wouldn't be able to hum it or anything. Right, okay. Uh, Elaine, do you know? I know the seal lullaby, but I don't know the one that you're talking about that Duncan did. Right, so. right. well, I think then sometime through the summer, you don't, it's not, if stuff happens, Heather, you, you have to be here or not here on a Sunday, but if you could pop in between now and Christmas. <laughs> 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 Give yourself time to get your fingers round it and everything else. I know it is, but I know there's. I think there's more than one, to be fair. But I think that there is. I think there is a, quite a famous one. I do have the. I I too have it somewhere tucked away in an apple box under my bed, <laughs> with all my other bits of music. Thank you very much for being here this evening. I've had a wonderful time. Um, I went and got myself a beer after I went to the loop so I could sit here for the next two hours and listen to you fellas telling stories because I think we've had some wonderful stories tonight from all over the world. And thank you very much for joining me. My name's Mike Rust. We run a festival. When we can ever have a festival called Get a Word in Edgeways, which will be in a field in the middle of Shopshire. We're not, we can, for obvious reasons, we can't have it this year. Anyway, over to you, John. We are joint hosts today, so I'll put you back to the world story. Oh, well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for all yeah. their poems and their stories. It has been a fantastic, I think, a round of applause. Yes. And uh, it was so good to hear some people who occasionally just listen, and we've heard, we've heard all of you tonight, which has been fantastic. Coming up, two people... I hope we'll be back with this on Tuesday. Elsa, if you're around on Tuesday for our young tellers, that would be fantastic. Five o'clock every Tuesday evening, we have young tellers from around the world. Jasname will be back for that. And there's tellers from all over the world. They're from Gaza and everywhere. Friday is Kath Edwards. Ah... Uh, doing stories for children at six o'clock, which is fantastic. Next Sunday, which is the other Sunday, we have uh, when Greats meet, Greats meet, and that is Mother Sea, Baden Prince, and Solar Story. So next Sunday, 
I shall be in a field. Hopefully, I'll be able to announce it and listen to it. But um, I'll be at New Forest Folk Festival next Sunday night. But I'll, right. I'll do it. I'll probably run it from a tablet. Um, if not, Bubba, so you're going to have to announce yourself. But I will try, try my best with the technology. I can help you, out if you want to, John. Well, if you could, if you could be there just in case, I can't. Um, yeah, I can help out. It's me. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm. I. You never well, know with signals on a tablet, but well, just in just in case, because England will be at the European Football Championships, beating whoever it's going to be. So I might not. I won't be watching the football. But there, there's a couple of things on that <laughs> week. I don't <laughs> want to mention the fact that the Scots got chucked out of that competition. No, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> Mike, Mike, this is this is a time of international. Uh, love and peace. No, um, uh, well, no well, that's well, fantastic. It's, no. it's, it's the football. <laughs> and also, and as always, Ali, thank you very much for providing right. the magic carpet that has taken us around thank the world. You, just thank before you, you go. Yeah, just, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Trying to get a word in edgeways. I'm trying to get a word in edgeways. Edgeway. Just before you go, we have our concert online on Thursday, and we've got Dan Keddy. And we've got um, some wonderful stories and poetry and all sorts of things. It's eight o'clock on a Thursday night. I ought to know the line out. Well, Amy hasn't told me, so I'll blame her. Okay, but I know Dan Kedding is, is on from America. So uh, we're going to have a wonderful evening. It's five quid a ticket. Come along and listen to us all. And all the people I'm looking at, I want you to do that concert at one point in the future. But uh, I'll get started on it. Okay. Ruby Cat's well, Cupboard. Kath's cupboard's in it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and Kath's doing uh, John's on, she, she's doing the world, so she, Kath is a wonderful friend of mine. <coughs> I've known her three weeks because she's only 18. <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, it's lovely, it's been lovely to see you all, and thank you once more, Mike. You always run a good session. Oh, I've enjoyed every moment. All oh, come back. I can't do this without you fellas turning up. And I promise Heather and uh, Aisha, uh, I promise to do the Stanley Robinson. So I know I've got one. There's another. Uh, Elsa. We go for Elsa. We got it. Yes. Got it. <laughs> I got it. Right. I promise to do it. I, I, I have sorted out. I've been having a long think and people have been nagging me about it. So I've got one. There are seven that I know. So I've only got six more to think about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, John. Good night, yeah. all. Thank you all. <laughs> everyone, thanks. On the way to great. Eat. Really good. Okay, cheers, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Ali. Go, go yeah, enjoy, go, go enjoy eating the relatives, Barbara. No, I mean eating with the relatives. Enjoy eating the food. with the relatives and having a drink, uh, not beer, but having a drink in Mike's honor. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Bye. And all of your honor. Take Bye. care. Bye. Oh wait, Cheers, John, Bye -bye. John, John, John. Yeah. I'm not scheduled oh, yeah. for this Friday coming up. Aren't there two tellers? No, not the, this Friday is only cast. The okay. Friday after that is you and uh, Jan Janina. Okay. I have to ask because sometimes I get it backwards. I know I have it on the calendar, but I always like to check to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for this. Oh, it's been a brilliant night. Isn't it? <laughs> Marvelous. All right. Take care. Bye, Ali. See you out. Take care, yeah. Ali. <laughs>